Thank you very much. And uh, I want to first uh, thank the School of Natural Sciences for being so hospitable uh, during my sabbatical leave and uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak about this, this topic. So uh, my area of statistical mechanics, I know that what I'm going to be talking about today is not a typical physics talk. So I'm purposely going to make this a survey, okay? And it's actually going to be kind of a well, impressionistic survey without getting into a lot of mathematical detail. Uh, but it's going to be, I would say, a whirlwind tour through various uh, topics on hyper-uniformity. And um, if you're interested in details, I would refer you to this article, this review article. And it's highly recommended for uh, insomniacs because if you read it at night, it's guaranteed to put you to sleep. <laughs> now, okay, so the way I'm going to introduce the topic is to talk about some familiar uh, subject area um, having to do with what we traditionally think about uh, the notion of long range order crystals and quasi crystals. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that we now know there's a multitude of distinguishable states of matter that break continuous translational rotational symmetries of a liquid differently from a solid, and by that I mean a crystal. And so what I'm showing on the left is a kind of typical crystal structure. On the right, you see a quasi-crystal structure. Now, quasi-crystals taught us how to generalize the concept of long-range order. They possess no long, no long range translational order, but long range orientational order with prohibited crystallographic symmetries. Okay. And Shackman, of course, got the, the Nobel Prize for discovering this uh, actual material. And Levine and Steinhardt laid the theoretical foundation for understanding uh, quasi crystals. And on the left side here, I show a diffraction pattern which, which exhibits. This kind, these kinds of translational and rotational symmetries that I was just describing. And then on the right, you see prohibited. This is actually the Penrose tunnel, the fraction pattern. And you can see that it has tenfold rotational symmetry, which is prohibited crystallographically. Um, now, uniformity generalizes this established notion of long range order. And that's a simple statement. And to begin, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe qualitatively what it is, and then I'll talk about it quantitatively. So a hyper-uniform many-particle system is one in which large-scale density fluctuations. And imagine, when I think about this, the setting actually should be uh, all of Euclidean space. So you have an infinite set of points in Euclidean space. And... Um, it's one in which the large scale density fluctuations are, are greatly suppressed compared to those typical disordered systems like liquids. All perfect crystals, periodic systems, and quasi crystals are hyper uniform. So, hyper uniformity provides a unified means of categorizing and characterizing crystals, quasi crystals, and special disordered systems, which I have not told you anything about yet. Thus, hyper uniformity concept generalizes our traditional notions of long range order, as I will show you. Okay, now the disordered varieties, you can think of them as new ideal states of disordered matter in that they behave more like crystals or quasi crystals in the way they suppress large scale density fluctuations, and yet are also like liquids and glasses since they are statistically isotropic structures with no bright peaks. They can exist as both equilibrium and non-equilibrium phases. They come in quantum mechanical and classical varieties, and they are endowed with unique bulk physical properties. And I want to point out that there is a lot that we still don't know theoretically, and there are many experimental challenges. Okay, so now, uh, part of the talk, not all of the talk, will be to describe some of these exotic disordered varieties. And just to give you a partial list of how the variety of topics and contexts that they arise in classical equilibrium liquids and ground states, 
classical non-equilibrium systems, quantum systems, sphere packings, random matrices, dynamical systems in quantum chaos, number theory, biological systems, and novel materials. Okay, so the rest of the talk, the outline of the rest of the talk, I'll get just a, a bit more quantitative of what we mean by hyperuniformity. I'll talk about it as an inverted critical phenomenon. I'll talk about how minimizing variance is actually a special type of a ground state. I'll talk about the variance as an order metric at large length scales. I'll make, I'll digress a bit by remarking on sphere packings in high dimensions. I'll give a variety of different examples of disordered hyperuniform systems in various space dimensions. And then I'll finally end with some generalizations of the hyperuniformity concept that go beyond point patterns or point processes. All right, so um, this started out in a very, very simple paper where we're asking fundamental questions about large scale density fluctuations in a paper with Frank Stillinger in 2003. And I would like to point out that this, the idea for this actually was inspired by a paper that uh, Joel Leibowitz had shared with me on charge fluctuations. And so that led to this, this, this entire um, concept of hyperuniformity. And um, so what, I'm gonna, what, what I want to do is think about points, again, in Euclidean space, d-dimensional Euclidean space. And of course, they can represent molecules of a material, stars in a galaxy, trees in the forest, whatever you like. So here are three kinds of point configurations, just a portion of them. And I have a window, spherical window. This is a, an observation window. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this window of radius r and I'm gonna move it from place to place. And when I do that, I will count a different number of particles, right? So this is a, a problem that we could have given a kindergartner to count the number of points. It's like ring toss, right? And you count the number of points within the ring, but if you move it to another location, it will fluctuate. So there's a variance, a number variance associated with that, which is given by you know, the standard definition of the variance, which depends upon the radius of the window. And so what I'm showing on the left is actually garden variety disorder. On the right, I have a crystal structure. And on, in the middle, I have this, an exotic disordered hyperuniform system that I'll describe. Okay, so if you have Poisson point patterns and many disordered point patterns, so for an ideal gas or a liquid, a typical liquid, a typical liquid, or even a structural glass, they, they will have a, var a variance that grows like the volume of the window, R to the dimension. We call point patterns whose variance grows more slowly than R to the dimension, hyperuniform. This implies that the structure factor, or what, if I can make contact with what you talk about, the spectral form factor, basically going to be the Fourier transform of the two-point correlation function, or what I could gather from those scattering patterns that I showed you earlier, okay, directly proportional to scattering intensity, that in the infinite wavelength limit, so when the wave vector goes to zero, this structure factor, this intensity goes to zero. That's another way of thinking about hyperuniformity. So all perfect crystals and many perfect crystals are hyperuniform such that the variance actually grows like the surface area of the window. Now this is extremely easy to see in the case of a crystal structure. Um, I guess I had that backward I was talking before because I had the diagrams I reversed the diagrams recently. So the crystal structure is actually, no. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, the, so the crystal structure here, um, nothing much is happening within the bulk, right? And so when I toss this different locations, uh, the, the fluctuations are concentrated near the interface. So it's not, it's physically reasonable to think that those fluctuations should grow like the surface area of the window. It's less trivial in the case of quasi-crystals that you should expect that kind of surface area growth. Okay. Sorry, 
Um, so the fact that the structure function goes to zero at infinite wavelength is true both for perfect crystals and for for anything. For anything, it just yes. exists of a ghost on both. Yes, right? exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah, this is a good ge generic. Generic. Okay. Yeah. Which, which is going to enable me to classify things. Okay. So hyperuniformity. Oh, then I should have said. Well, here's the here's the example now of the exotic variety. So here's this a disordered system that actually behaves on large length scales, just like this crystal. So its variance grows like the surface area, which is extremely weird, bizarre kind of behavior. And um, because the garden variety does not behave, behave like that, it behaves like this. And that's, that's very important for physics, as we'll see later. All right, so now just to give you some, uh, make contact with uh, typical systems just to orient you with respect to the correlation function. So if I have a particle system in d-dimensional space at number density rho, G2 is nothing more than the pair correlation function. You fix, your, fix yourself on a point, what's the probability of density associated with finding another point a radial distance away? That's what G2 measures. And then the, four, the structure factor is essentially going to be related to the Fourier transform of that object. In fact, you subtract one from this because if it's a disordered system, this is defined to be one for large R when there's no long range order. So H of R, the total correlation function goes to zero if you have typical short range disordered systems. Okay, and so S of K is then the Fourier transform of this, which I denote as H tilde, multiplied by rho add one. Now, if you have an ideal gas or Poisson distribution of points, G2 is one for all R. If, uh, and then the corresponding structure factor is one for all K. Now, I want to just make a, a technical point. I'm actually excluding what's referred to as the forward scattering in the diffraction pattern, okay? But that's, that's just a technicality right now. Uh, when you define hyperuniformity, you have to do that. Anyway, here's a liquid. And the point I want to make is that in the case of this li typical liquid, the structure factor is not going to zero as K goes to zero. And we'll see that that's related to the compressibility of the system. For a lattice, I'm doing an angular average. And of course, you're going to have gaps between the Dirac functions where you have particles. And then the structure factor looks very similar to that up to, let's say, the first Bragg peak, you have a gap. So in some sense, crystal structures, right, are happening to form trivially, but not necessarily uh, generically in the sense that you could ask the question, among all crystals, which in a particular dimension, which minimizes the variance. And that's a problem connected to number theory that I'll talk about. Now, if you have a quasi-crystal, as I said, it's much more subtle, because in the case of the uh, scattering pattern here, you actually have um, dense Bragg peaks. So you have Bragg peaks, and they're dense in the sense that if you find any two direct functions, like this here and here, you can always find one in between. If you have these two, you can always find one in between. Okay, now the reason why I'm saying something about the quasi-crystal here, even though I'm not gonna spend that much time on it, is because we'll see the prime numbers in some bizarre way related to this kind of a structure. And then you have here a disordered hyperuniform system where you can see that the structure factor is vanishing uh, as k goes to zero. Okay, now what I'm showing you. Sorry, can, can I back you with another? Yeah, sure. The, the plot you showed before for the loop, right? Yes. Um, do I understand? So S of K is in that essentially is the two point is the imaginary part of the two point function of the density or something, right? Yeah, but ex except the, you mean the, the structure factor or the. Yeah, yes. Yeah. The structure factor is going to be the real. So I'm taking the, the, right. the, the modulus squared divided by. Yeah, and so. Yeah. But in a fluid, you now the fact that I have a at k going to zero, the dynamics is dominated by the ghost of Moltron. Shouldn't that tell me that S of k should go to zero? No, I didn't say that. I said that if it's a perfect crystal, right? If it's a perfect crystal and there, there's no phonons, okay? Yeah. If it's a perfect crystal, then it has to be hyperuniform. If I have phonons, right, 
then it turns out you can actually destroy perfect hydrogen fluoride. Now, here I'm showing a scale. This is three dimensions. Take the number of variants. I'm dividing it by the volume of the window, basically, right? So this quantity here has to, if it's hyper uniform, has to be a descending function of R. Now, here's a typical, well, it's not a typical disorder, not a uh, non hyper uniform system, but it's just to emphasize that this is just flat. Okay, it's not descending. This is a disordered hyper uniform system. So it descends as a function of R when I scale it this way. And then this is a ordered pattern. You have small scale fluctuations on the order, for example, of the lattice spacing, but then on average, it's also descending. Okay, now this is, this is actually a very important uh, connection that I wanna make with equilibrium systems. So from the grand canonical uh, ensemble, it's well known that you can relate on the left-hand side, the isothermal compressibility, Okay. This is the temperature. And I'm um, denoting the grand canonical ensemble with this star to indicate this is in the grand canonical ensemble. And this is a scale variance. We know that that is equal to the structure factor at the origin. And that in turn is actually equal to one plus rho volume integral of H, this total correlation function. Now, some observations. Any ground state, T is equal to zero in which the isothermal compressibility is bounded and positive must be hyper uniform. So even if this is positive, if this is T is equal to zero, S of K has to be zero. Now, this is going to include crystal ground states, but what I'll talk about later, exotic disordered ground states. However, if, if uh, you have a hyper uniform system at positive temperature, the only way that that system can be hyper uniform is for the isothermal compressibility itself to be zero. Now, I will tell you that that's a really bizarre liquid. And I'll give you an example of that later. It's just something to keep in mind. You're always coming up against these things that challenge your previous understanding of things. Okay, now another very important point, I think for this audience is that at a thermal critical point, say icing critical point, liquid vapor critical point. It's anti-hyper uniform in the sense that the structure factor actually diverges to plus infinity. So that's as far away from hyper uniformity as you can be. So we call those anti-hyper uniform systems. And we were talking about ground states, that's in the classical case or also in the quantum mechanics? It should be in the quantum case as well. Okay, just again, pictures are worth a thousand words. Right? So here is an icing critical point. And of course you can see that the system even by eye is gonna have really large scale uh, fluctuations. So it's anti hyper uniform. Okay, now let me make uh, a comment about um, the, uh, the number variance. So that's key to defining things with respect to hyper uniformity. Now, it turns out, and not surprisingly, if you have the variance, it actually only depends upon the density, which would be the average value of n, and the uh, two-point correlation function. And in, in particular, I'm showing it in terms of h, this total correlation, total correlation function that I mentioned earlier. And then there's a geometric quantity that's multiplying it that has to do with the window. So let me just spend a few words about that. So what is this? This is the volume common to two windows of capital radius R, whose, whose centers are separated by little r, divided by the volume of the sphere, which means, and if I plot that versus little r divided by two times r, by construction at zero, this has to be one because they have complete overlap. And then you have compact support after two times r, because there's no common volume. And you can write down this expression in any dimension, and I'm just showing it here in the first five space dimensions. So it's a decreasing function, and it has compact support. And that will mean something in a little while. Okay, 
Now, you can do the asymptotics here for large R and for a certain class under certain assumptions, you can show that this asymptotic variance looks like the following, looks like the following expansion. Um, you have a term that is proportional to R to the dimension. And I'm gonna call that coefficient here, the volume coefficient for obvious reasons. And then, then you have the next term in the expansion is a surface area term. And um, that is the surface area coefficient, oddly enough. And um, A is nothing more than the structure factor at zero. B is just one higher order moment of H, okay? Now, hyperuniformity means if A is equal to zero, so you have no volume term, and B is, has to be non-negative, okay? That's the definition of hyperuniformity, and therefore it implies in direct space, this sum rule, rho volume integral of H has to be equal to minus one. That's another way of getting at hyperuniformity if you prefer direct space. Okay, then uh, I'm not gonna say anything about hypersufficial. Um, that just means you lack um, a surface area term, but we're gonna see in a little while that you can have other scalings that go between the surface area and the volume. Okay, now I wanna talk about hyperuniformity as a kind of a, in what I'm gonna call inverted critical point. So without getting into a lot of details, um, this comes out of what Ornstein and Zernica studied in the early part of the 20th century to understand critical phenomena. They have the ornstein zernica equation. And um, basically the idea was they wanted to understand how you could, how you could get short range interactions accumulating in such a way that when you're near a critical point, H of R actually becomes long ranged in the sense that it's volume integral flows up. Okay, and what they did was they divided up H into two contributions, direct correlations via, via C of R, a quantity called the direct correlation function and indirect correlation functions. It's an integral equation. And you can solve for this integral equation. And in Fourier space, it looks like this. Now, for any hyperuniform system, by definition, as I mentioned earlier, H tilde at k is equal to zero, that's satisfying the sum rule. And thus, you look at the denominator that's blowing up. And therefore, uh, if you are at a, at a hyperuniform point, this quantity H of R is in fact short ranged in the sense that its volume integral does not blow up. But C of R is long ranged in the sense that its volume integral blows up. It's exactly the opposite of what you get with an icing critical point. Exactly the opposite happens. So H of R is the long ranged quantity and C of R is the short ranged quantity. So this is exactly the inverse. Now, you can write down um, scaling laws, and I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, except to say that this looks reminiscent of what happens with regular critical points, except the, the point being is that this is the object that in fact becomes long ranged and you have a critical exponent that goes with it. Um, the other point I wanna make is that to think about C of R, if you have an equilibrium system, it's useful to think about it as an effective kind of pair potential, because uh, under mild conditions, the, uh, the pair potential scaled with KBT is actually for large R, like minus C of R. So if you look at this expression here, that means you can think of these kinds of systems effectively as uh, these kind of generalized long range Coulombic interactions. But if it's out of equilibrium, you don't need to have long range interactions. If you have systems that are out of equilibrium, you can actually achieve hyperuniformity with short range interactions, as we'll see. Okay, now here's, here's a slide that I'm just throwing out because you guys are experts. If the, I, I can't think of a better audience to direct this open question to than you, uh, and that is, Currently, we lack field theoretic methods and realization group techniques to treat hyperuniform critical points. 
It's just the way it is. Are there critical exponents on undefined? Yes, they are. The, the critical exponents are well defined. Are they? Are you going to discuss some examples? Unfortunately, not. <laughs> oh, by the way, anything uh, you know, certainly anything that I am not able to cover today, I would be very happy to speak with you individually uh, at some other time. But yeah, because I'm covering so many things, one, I'm probably not going to be able to get to that today. Okay. So anyway, now let's consider a single configuration. Okay. A single configuration, but large, not ensemble. All right. Instead, now I can write down the variance as a pairwise sum over that geometric quantity that I showed you earlier. Okay. And remember that, ge that, that quantity has this monotonic compact support behavior. Okay, so this should remind you of a pair potential. All right. And so that means finding the global minimum of this variance at some particular R is equivalent to finding the ground state. So what's beautiful about this is that it's a purely geometric problem, but somehow it's changed to a physics ground state problem if you want to find the minimum. All right, now what I'm showing you here, I take for this single configuration, in fact, you have a coefficient that multiplies the surface area term that fluctuates, right? So it fluctuates like this. Uh, it's not like the stock market. Uh, so I was able to be able to predict this, I'd be able to make a lot of money, but this is actually, you know, deterministic. And um, then the, the key question is, what is the average value of this, lamb, this fluctuating quantity? I'm gonna call that lambda bar. That's actually a really interesting coefficient that I'll talk about now. Okay. So for any dimension, let's define lambda bar to be that quantity that I just showed you, lambda of r, integrated from zero to L, one over L, L going to infinity. So the lower this surface area coefficient, the greater the suppression of large scale fluctuations in a high uniform system. That's the punchline there. And so if you want to now look at hyper uniform systems under the same umbrella, I can evaluate this coefficient for different systems. And this is in one dimension. You can prove that the integer lattice, we prove that this is actually a trivial proof, that the integer lattice is the, the winner in one dimension. And then you have the Fibonacci chain in the middle here. Well, the Fibonacci chain is nothing more than the one dimensional analog of Penrose. So it's a one dimensional quasi crystal. And so that's where it fits. And then you have random patterns below. Okay, so does anybody want to guess the winner in two dimensions? I go to two dimensions. So this is audience participation time to stop you from falling asleep. The winner is the lowest number. The what? What are we trying to win? Uh, we're trying to minimize, we're trying to find the pattern that minimizes that guy. The triangular lattice actually is the winner, actually. The triangular lattice is the winner. Then you have the square lattice, the honeycomb lattice, Kagame lattice. Look at where the, where the quasi crystal comes in. And then you have some disordered patterns that I'm not gonna talk about except for this one later. The point is, is that these, this is the ranking you get if this is your large scale order metric. Does anybody wanna guess the winner then in three dimensions? I'm sorry? The body center letter. The body center, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, it turns out most people would not say that. <laughs> <laughs> you stole my thunder. <laughs> most, <laughs> most people would say it was the FCC, right? Because the energy lattice is the densest way to stack pennies. The triangle lattice is the densest way to stack pennies on the table. And then, you know, your grocer knows how to stack oranges, right? FCC. Well, it's, it's actually the dual, it's actually the dual 
I have to confess, I thought that DCC was the desk. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You didn't steal my phone. <laughs> <laughs> FCC, so it's the BCC, and there are actually really good reasons for it, which I unfortunately do not have time to describe. Okay? But it is, it's the dual actually of the FCC. It's the dual S. Now, we can we had we carried out calculations in higher dimensions. Sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Can I play the dumb bro? Can you explain what BCC and FCC is? <laughs> ah, yeah. FCC is the okay. The way I described it earlier is you take the way your grosser stacks arch is in the, in the grosser stack. You start out with a hexagonal lattice, then in the dimples you put another layer. Okay, that's AB, and if you do it according to ABC, ABC. That's FCC. And then if you take the Fourier transform of that, that's the BCC. That's the dual. Okay, thanks. And it's unusual because uh, actually one, <laughs> uh, what Juan was saying is actually typically true for most kinds of interactions. It's FCC, that's the one. Okay, so it's unusual that BCC is the one. Now, okay. So this is this is again this is a more general statement. So now what I'm going to do is connect it to the Epstein zeta function of number theory, which of course I, when I when I did this I had no idea it was connected to this. Okay, so every lattice lattice vector p has a dual or reciprocal lattice that we call lambda star, in which the sites of the lattice are specified by the dual lattice vector. Okay, we showed that if the if you have a lattice, then the number variance has this closed form expression. Now, you can then extract from this, this coefficient. Now look at what you see here, okay? Now this is in reciprocal space. So this is a power law interaction in reciprocal space. So if I can find out what the ground state is in this setting, then I have the, the ground state. And so it turns out integer wins, triangular wins in two, BCC wins, three dimensions. And this guy here is directly related to the Epstein zeta function for a lattice, which you can think of as a generalization of the Riemann zeta function, which I learned from Peter Sarda. So when I shared with him my results about this, uh, he informed me of you know, this, connection. And uh, then subsequently, they in fact wrote a, a very, very nice paper uh, with Strom Bergson that studied uh, the Epstein zeta function, which is more ge general than this quantity, uh, for dimensions 4, 8, and 24. Had some theorems for that and some other results. Anyway, it's, it's fascinating that it's connected this way. And uh, for some D, configurations with the smallest known average variance are related to the densest strip packings, which now I want to divert to, to talk about. So what I'm showing you here for selected dimensions is the variance, this coefficient, this lambda bar. And then in this column, I'm showing you the densest known sphere packing. Now in some cases, provably the densest, okay? So for dimensions one, two, and three, the best known solutions for both problems are lattices or their duals. Then if you go to higher dimensions, then all bets are off. Okay? Sometimes it does. Now, as it turns out, dimension eight and dimension 24 stand out because they're the E8 lattice, E8 root lattice is always the winner, and so is the leech lattice. Okay. And this was proven uh, via, via uh, Savaska, and then for the leech uh, for E8, and then Cohen and company, including her, uh, for dimension 24. Now, I was interested in the question about packing spheres in very high dimensions. And so the, the first cartoon here is an illustration of why lattices have to actually fail miserably as you make the space dimension very large. So here is a, here is a fundamental cell for a hypercubic packing. 
okay, depicted in two dimensions, radius one. And um, if you're already in dimension four, so this is the, this diagonal, along this diagonal to where it touches the sphere, you can think of what happens to a sphere in very high dimensions is this kind of squeezed yellow region, okay? Most of the volume is gonna be at the interface as it turns out. And so already in dimension four, I can put another particle into this packing. It's unsaturated. I can put another particle into this packing and then I actually get the densest known packing in that dimension, which is D4 as it turns out. Now, so that means, to so this just illustrates that all, all lattice packings almost surely become unsaturated, okay? Uh, so I like to say they're gonna be very holy in very high dimensions. Then with, uh, with Frank Stillinger, we wrote a paper where we had a conjecture uh, for a linear program lower bound on the maximal packing fraction that looks like this. Okay. And this is actually a well-defined quantity, but the coefficient you can see is 0 0.7786, so dot, dot, dot. And that provides the putative, I would say, exponential improvement over Minkowski's 100-year-old bound. In fact, it's older than 100 years now. One over two to the D that says that if you want to have the densest packing, if you want to find the densest packing, it has at least that packing fraction. And this relies on the fact that it's a uh, disordered packing. I don't have time to describe that. I could give a, you know, just a lecture on this. But the thing that I want to make a point about is that this is this LP bound is formulation is the dual to cone LP's upper bound. And that same LP formulation has been used to get upper bounds on the spectral gap for spinless modular bootstrap by uh, Hartman et al, including Illumal, still on here. There he is. Uh, and others. Okay. And so one of the questions I would like to know for that community is why not try to get a test function like we used, but for this prop, for the bootstrap problem. Okay. Now, as I said to you, there are, if you have, there are other classes. If you have a structure factor that scales like this, where alpha is the exponent, you can prove that there are three possible scaling behaviors. One is the surface area, if alpha is greater than one. One has a logarithmic correction if alpha is exactly equal to one. And then one is, is this scaling between surface and uh, volume when alpha is between zero and one. So class one is the strongest form of hyperuniformity. Class three is the weakest form of hyperuniformity. So in class one, we find crystals, quasi-crystals, disordered ground states, one component plasma, Laughlin's incompressible quantum fluid. Uh, I'm not gonna say anything about that. Vortex structures and superconductors. Class two, quasi-crystals, again, classical disordered ground states, non-trivial uh, Riemann zeros, eigenvalues of random matrices, fermionic point processes, superfluid helium, that's actually stuff that Feynman had done. Uh, maximally random jam packings, prime numbers, which I hope if I can get to it, I'll say a few words about. And then class three, you can see these. But the other point I wanna make is that if you think about this, you don't have to focus necessarily on hyperuniform systems. What about just general non-hyperuniform systems? Well, if they're typical, so means this exponent here is basically going to this means alpha, uh, alpha is equal to zero means it's going to some constant unbounded uh, value. That's typical. And then of course the anti-hyperuniform are here. What this means is then you can classify all translationally invariant states of matter according to their large scale density fluctuations. So, you know, we like to talk about correlated disorder and all kinds of, you know, that is kind of like uh, very, very, um, qualitative, this quantifies things for you, uh, you know, according to their large scale density fluctuations. Now, what I wanna now do for the remaining part of the lecture 
is I want to go back under the hyperuniformity lens and revisit results that I didn't know about in 2003. And then I'm going to talk about more recent examples in 2D, 3D, and higher. All right. So this is, this is an example that everybody, most I, I would imagine most people in this room know about, but it's really nice to hit upon some key points. Uh, there turn out to be a variety of different systems in R that are disordered and hyperuniform with this pair correlation function. So this is the pair correlation function. And then the structure factor has this ramp, linear ramp up to two pi in these units and then flat forever. Okay. Now, you know, people know about G2 tending to zero and the, and, uh, the points repelling one another as a result. Eigenvalues of random Hermitian matrices, GUE, Dyson, of course, famously did this. The non trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function, Montgomery. Now, I'm putting here a spectrum of black hole microstates where you replace this K with time. And of course, there are many papers uh, that have been written on this topic. And uh, this includes uh, Shinkar and Phil Saad. And then they have follow up papers. Now, and speak, by the way, this only this really is only true for sufficiently large times. But according to a, a brief conversation that I have with Phil, I don't know if he's here. Oh, there's, there's Phil. There might be, might be a qualitative, from based upon qualitative arguments, there might be a way of uh, taking a limit in which you rigorously have this, which would mean perfect type of uniformity. Um, this is less believable. Bus arrival times in Cuenca, Beca, Mexico. I, I, I find it a bit difficult to believe that that's true. Um, okay, now Dyson. Dyson mapped the GUE solution to a 1D log Coulomb gas at positive temperature. Now, again, this is something that I think everybody in this room knows, right? But I'm, I, what I want to emphasize by showing this well-known result is that you know the log gas? You have this coulombic interaction. This is on. Think of this as on the line, and this is the two D coulomb interaction. Okay, this is just to illustrate the fact that you have to have at positive temperature. You have to have these long range interactions in an equilibrium phase. Okay. Now you can actually. Oops. You can actually map random Hermitian matrices, GUE, fermionic gases and zeros of the original zeta function to that unique hyperuniform system that I mentioned. But how do you go from a one-dimensional type random matrix where you have eigenvalues? How do you generalize this idea to higher dimensions? Well, the fermionic system is the natural way of doing it. And it's trivial, as it turns out. And you can write this down in any dimension. Here's the scaling behavior of G2 for any, any space dimension, okay? And you always have this, it's controlled by one over R to the V plus one. So you can see here that this involves these um, long range pair correlations. And I'm distinguishing that from the interactions, long range interactions, okay? And in particular, it's always gonna be for the structure factor, linear with some coefficient that depends on the dimension. Okay, now this turns out to be a special case of a determinable point process. And I don't have any time to dis discuss that, but there's a reference. Um, okay, now I wanna just say a few words about one component plasmas and linked to quantum Hall effect. Okay, so a one component plasma, very similar to what I've just shown in one dimension, consists of particles of charge E interacting via the Coulomb potential immersed in a rigid uniform background of opposite charge. But now we're dealing with just log of R in two dimensions. And it turns out that uh, mathematicians have shown that uh, this in fact is also uh, rigorously a model of uh, vortex structures in superconductors. Uh, this is by Sylvia Surpati at uh, Courant Institute and her colleagues. Oops. 
was descending into chaos. Um, okay, now for a special coupling constant, Ciancovici showed that the total correlation function is this Gaussian, which means that the structure factor is given by this. Again, one minus a Gaussian. So that means this scale is like k squared. Okay, so it's a different scale. It's in the class one hyperuniformity. I just would like to remind you the Dyson stuff was class two because it was linear. And um, you got these long range correlations. This is definitely not long range correlations. This is Gaussian. This is faster than exponential. So you don't need long range correlations to get hyperuniformity. Okay, and Laughlin's uh, celebrated onsets for the ground state wave function associated with fractional quantum Hall can be mapped to this classical 2D OCP in which the charges depend upon the filling fraction. He called that the incompressible quantum fluid. I think that was in the, that was in the title of the paper. And then we actually uh, looked at, uh, we proved that uh, while Heisenberg ensembles are hyperuniform, which include uh, extensions of this Geneva ensemble uh, that models electron distributions in higher than Landau levels. All right, now there was a conjecture that we made that if you take, okay, marbles and you put them into a container, shake them up, okay, I'm gonna call that just for the sake of argument, maximally random jammed, okay? You've reached, you've reached a point at which the, the system somehow freezes up, it jams. And we conjectured that in fact, these systems, which are out of equilibrium, are hyperuniform. And so that was shown with Alexander Donov, who's now at the Courant, and Frank Stillinger. Okay. You can see this is the structure factor. This is a numerical experiment. These are extremely hard problems to get any theory for. But between friends, this is pretty close to being hyperuniform. <laughs> and um, this contradicts the picture that Hart's fear uh, that the, the this is a prototypical glass, I'm going to say. It's an out of equilibrium state. And most, the traditional understanding is that it's a glass, a structural glass is like a frozen in liquid. And that's actually telling you, this, this is telling you, no, that's not the case. There's a fundamental difference between the structure of a glass and the structure of a liquid. So and you, the structure of the glass is like this. Excuse me? You're thinking that the structure of the glass is like this? Yes, this uh, you can you can consider this to be uh, ideal structural class. Okay, now in the eye of a chicken. Okay? So this this sounds bizarre. This animal vision expert from Washington University came to me with this beautiful data. Can I just one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. When you said all jammed uh, spherical. Is that fr with friction or do you know what happens? If That's a fantastic question. So everything that I have said applies to frictionless. And in, pr in principle, equal sized, and there are other conditions such that it has to be saturated. There's a bunch of conditions that go with it that I didn't describe. And, and the friction break, can one understand how the friction breaks? Friction, friction could mess things up. Because you can, you can, you, you you might be able to find voids mm -hmm. because of that that are kind of you know Isn't the that, that break up the hyperuniformity kind yeah. of structure to them, right? So I mean, right. it might not completely fall apart, right? It might not, depending upon yeah, what kind of a system, how you prepare it. Okay. Uh, okay. So if you know about retina, you have cones that detect color. Birds have five cones. They can see much better than us. We have three. And so this Joe Corbo, the animal vision expert, came to us with data. And we thought that we could approach this as a packing problem, because that's what we like to do. It wasn't a packing, it wasn't a typical packing problem. Then when I thought about it, I said, well, wait a minute, let's check to see if these are hyper uniform. And so you have these five cones. And then this is actual data. Uh, for the different types, violet, green, blue, red. And this is the total population. So you could see in all cases, to the extent that one can determine it accurately, hyper uniform, 
And then you ask yourself why, right? And in addition to that, it's multi hyperuniform meaning that each component is separately hyperuniform plus the entire population is hyperuniform. What does that mean? Well, red cones don't like to cluster around other red cones because then you won't be able to sample light uniformly. So red has to be as far from red as possible. Blue should be as far from blue as possible, but in, arranged in such a way, right, that it's the most uniform. And that's how it solves this problem. So this is an amazing, this is something that if you had asked me about before, I would have said I wouldn't be able to come up with this solution. So it, there, there are biological reasons why it's multi hyper uniform. Okay, and then you, we, we actually showed with them, oops, we actually showed, oh, sorry, with Enrique Loma that there is a statistical mechanical model of hard disk plasmas that enable you to produce rigorously multi hyper uniformity. Okay. Now, you know, I'm, I was talking about classical ground states before. Now, let me just say a few words about that. We know that, you know, usually if you take a liquid, you cool it at a constant pressure, it undergoes a phase transition. And when you go to absolute zero, you get a perfect crystal structure, a high crystallographic symmetry. Are there non-trivial interactions that enable you to get something that is disordered? Okay. Obviously, I wouldn't be asking the question if I didn't have an answer. And now I'm going to tell you how to do that. And it's, four, it's a Fourier-based idea. So you consider n particles with a configuration in a flat torus with a pair potential, V, that is bounded with this Fourier transform V tilde. So I write down the standard total potential in terms of the pairwise, but because I have this periodic setting, I can write this in Fourier space like this, okay, sum over weight vectors, okay? And you see the appearance of the structure factor plus this constant that is independent of the structure. Okay, so the idea is if you make, you design now, not the potential direct space, but it's Fourier transform to be something positive and then zero after some cutoff, I call that cutoff capital K. Now, if you can move the particles in a, around in that periodic box such that you drive the system, have a structure factor that is zero for this entire range, we call that stealthy. So if you can produce a stealthy configuration, this is zero, it conflicts. You have two step functions multiplying each other, essentially, that conflict. And by doing that, I'm at the ground state because this is a structure independent constant, if that makes sense. Does everybody understand that point? Okay. Now, um, that means that this, for, this localized Fourier transform produces this non-localized long-range interaction in direct space. So that's a very important point. And it turns out these exotic, so if you, and, and the point is you can do this, so I won't get into a lot of details. These exotic hyperuniform ground states are called stealthing, and when disordered, turn out to be highly degenerate. And you can think of these as a classical analogs of quantum spin liquids. So the direct space potentials are long range, reminiscent of Friedel oscillations of, of the electron density in a variety of systems. And the stealthy patterns can be tuned by varying the size of this, I'm gonna call that the exclusion, the size of K, okay? The magnitude of K. And that's measured by this dimensionless parameter chi, which is gonna be the ratio, the number of, the ratio of the number of degrees of freedom, constrained degrees of freedom, I should say, where I'm setting the uh, structure factor to be zero at those wave vectors to the total degrees of freedom. <coughs> okay, so uh, you probably can't see this in the back of the room. I can't hardly see it. <laughs> this is supposed to see, uh, show a crystal. Can anybody see that back there? You can? Okay. Uh, and then this is a stealthy pattern. So if I remember, hybrid uniformity means I exclude the origin. So around the origin, there's an exclusion region, which means that there's no single scattering. If I had shown you just up to here, you would have thought I was showing you a crystal, okay? Because that's exactly what the crystal has. But in fact, there are diffuse scattering beyond that. Very, very weird. This is the, this is the weirdest among all uh, hybrid, disordered hybrid uniform systems. 
Okay. Now, okay, you, the statistical mechanical theory for these stealthy ground states is non-trivial because the dimensionality of the configuration space changes with this, this chi parameter. We, we devise this a type of a theory, statistical mechanical theory in this PRX. Okay. Now, for uh, chi, this dimension of this ratio between zero and 0.5, the stealthy ground states are highly degenerate, distorted and isotropic. And this is a picture at small chi. This is a picture at higher chi. As you make chi bigger and bigger, the short range order also increases. So it has this stealthy long range order, but as you increase chi also develops short range order. And if you go above a half, the system at t is equal to zero undergoes a transition to a crystal phase. So you go from, you have this one dimensional phase diagram where you have this disordered regime and then you have this crystal, these crystal phases here and the entropy actually decreases as chi increases. Okay, now it was thought until recently you needed to have Bragg scatter. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on applications, but I just wanna give you an idea of uh, why people might be interested in the physical properties of these exotic states. Okay, so a photonic band gap material, it means you have a structured material that if you shine light, uh, enables uh, the passage of light for certain frequencies, but not for others. Okay, so you can think of it as an omnidirectional mirror just for a certain range of wavelengths. And it was thought that you needed to have underlying periodic structure, dielectric, say high contrast dielectric material, and then air, for example. But we came along, this is with work with Paul Steinhardt, and Marion Florescu, we showed that if you take these stealthy point patterns that I mentioned earlier, you can actually map them into photonic material, actually networked materials. Think of them as tessellations with large complete band gaps. And that enables you to make crazy waveguides like this that you can't make with photonic crystals. So there are tremendous advantages it's robust against defects, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Now, other people have looked at optical properties, uh, transport properties, elastic properties, and they all seem to be really good properties. All right. So then you could ask the question, I think I'm gonna have to cut this out because of the time. Um, I did wanna say something about localization. And if anybody wants, I can talk about Anderson localization of the time. We're at the question time. Uh, why do very large distorted stealthy hyperuniform materials yield desirable physical properties? Well, an answer is partly because they are rotationally, um, this is supposed to be invariant, distorted materials with some characteristics of crystals, including the stealthiness that I mentioned and a bounded hole property. What's the bounded hole property? Holes of arbitrarily large size are prohibited in the thermodynamic limit. In a disordered system, if you have a Poisson distribution, you can find arbitrarily large holes. That's not true here. And you can prove, well, you conjectured uh, that this relation holds the maximum hole size, and it's inversely proportional to this capital K. And then this was proved by Ghosh and Leibowitz in 2018. Okay, so it looks like I'm actually on time <laughs> to be able to just say a few words, prime numbers, because I wanted to say something about prime numbers. Um, so this was work with Kazang. And the first thing that we did with this was to do a numerical study. So we, we're gonna, you know, if you look at Google, if you do a Google search, you'll find out that the prime numbers are thought to be pseudo random numbers. But I'm gonna show you here that if you look at intervals that they typically don't look at, that's not true. 
All right. So we treated the primes in some interval, M to M plus L, to be special lattice gas model. Primes are occupied sites on an integer lattice of spacing two that contains all of the positive odd integers and the unoccupied sites are the odd composite integers. So here's a picture. And what we did was we actually studied, so here's the, the interval that we studied, M large, L over M smaller than unity, but a constant. And we found unexpected structure on all length scales. This is a picture of the structure factor that was measured. Now this structure factor should be reminiscent of what I had shown you earlier for the quasi-crystal. And I'm gonna point out some differences. There is a type of self-similarity that we can predict. So this is with Matthew Kersey, Ireland and Gazang. Um, Matthew was actually a student, a graduate student of Peter Sarkis. So I realized that I didn't know what I didn't know about the prime numbers and um, brought him on board so that he could tell me if we were on the right track. And he was extremely instrumental in helping us, well, in helping me to learn a little number theory to make myself dangerous. Uh, now, in, in the, um, so we, we looked at this interval in particular, okay? M very large, the ratio L over M held constant. So this enables us to treat the primes as a homogeneous point process. In the infinite size, in a certain distinguished infinite size limit, I'm giving you, just giving you the bottom line. The primes are hyper uniform. And S of K is determined entirely by a set of dense Bragg peaks. So the point of showing you this is not to get delve into the detail, but whenever you have something that looks like this double sum like that, that's, that's what you would get with anything that involves dense, dense Bragg peaks like the Fibonacci sequence, okay? Now, unlike quasicrystals, the prime peaks occur at certain rational multiples of pi, which is similar to what are referred to as limit periodic systems. Limit periodic point sets, aperiodic structures with dense set of Bragg peaks generated from a union of periodic structures with ever increasing periodicities. But the primes show an erratic pattern of occupied and unoccupied sites, very different from the predictable and orderly patterns of standard limit periodic systems. So we call this, and if the primes then teach us about really a new state of matter that we're gonna call effectively limit periodic. Not only that, when you, when you do it in this kind of general sense where you can play with the interval size, you can identify transitions between ordered and the disordered prime regimes, which is nice. Okay, then there are other generalizations of hyperuniformity. So in this paper, what, what I, what I uh, wanted to do was to generalize to other kinds of situations. So for example, random scalar fields. Okay. This actually is a picture of spinodal decomposition that was done with one of my former students, who's like Ma, okay? Random vector and tensor fields. For example, in random media, where you have heat, current, electric, magnetic velocity, and stress fields, and also turbulence. Um, structurally and isotropic materials. So far, everything that I've talked about when it comes to disordered systems, had rotational invariance, but suppose you have anisotropy in the two-point function. Then you have to think about directional hyperuniformity. So you can actually have a scattering pattern that looks like this, okay, figure eight. So if I approach from this direction, okay, it's not hyperuniform, but if I approach from this direction, it's hyperuniform. And can you construct these? And the answer is yes. This, this happens to be a pattern and you can see this kind of anisotropic structure that corresponds to that scattering pattern. And then you can treat spin systems, both classical and quantum mechanical. So with that, I'll let you read the conclusions, but I wanna make sure that I 
thank my wonderful collaborators over the years, and thank you for your attention. Do we have any questions or so? I think you mentioned the distribution of galaxies. What was it, upper uniform or not? I'm sorry, which one? The distribution of galaxies. The uh, yes, yes, yes. So the Harrison Zeldovich spectrum of the early universe is presumed is putatively linear in K. And that's what I was referring to, yes. So one way. Oh, so let me ask a really naive question. All right, well out of my domain. And the, back to the to the, the, the packing problems and the friction versus non-friction. Is there a way to talk about robustness of this? So you've proved that, that if we had the packing with the frictionless spheres, then we're gonna have the hyper uniformity. If I perturb away from it, so very small enough, because that then, Leads to all sorts of problems, like you said, of how you. So that's a really, it. really good question. I'd like to address that in the following sense, because everything that I've talked about today had to do with perfect happy uniformity. And the question is, in reality, you know, just like you never have an infinite perfect crystal, right? You still study crystallography. Uh, in the same way, you're never going to have perfect hyper uniformity in a disordered system, just like you wouldn't have it's in a crystal. But you would ask the question. Uh, how close can I have a, can I come up with a measure of how close I am to hyper uniformity? And those exist. So you can actually quantify how close you are getting to a hyper uniform state. And you can show that there are certain crossover regimes, depending upon how close you get, that enable you to, so the scaling and the variance, right? We'll have two kinds of behaviors. One where you show a regime where it is hyper uniform, and then one where it's not. And then you can show that that crossover, as you approach the perfect type of uniform state, goes to infinity. I think I'm trying to ask if you can do it kind of the other way around, right? I mean, okay. stick with the infinite. Yeah. And now do a perturbation. I mean, is there a way to measure kind of a perturbation that says, I'm still in the infinite, how, Absolutely, how much, that's you know, energy or whatever it is that well, that was that was the one that I was just saying. Okay. So you tell, let me give you an example. Suppose I have a perfect lattice, mm -hmm. right? and now I perturb randomly, independently, the sites of that lattice within the fundamental cell of each. What happens? It turns out you can show that it's still hyper uniform right. with k squared, and then you have Bragg peaks. That's an example. Uh, the other, another example is if I have a, a true ground state, say Leonard Jones interaction, cool it to absolute zero. It's basically the structure of the density sphere packing. At a little temperature, one can show that in uh, in that situation, that the hyper uniformity S sub zero is now going to be is going to be proportional to the, the amount of temperature you add. So if you add an infinitesimal amount, the structural factor will depart infinitesimally from zero. But obviously, if you go to you know high, like near melting, then all bets are off. You no longer have, in that case, a hyper uniform. But you could ask, how close are you to hyper uniform? I was just wondering how much the notion of hyper uniformity depends on the fact that you chose a sphere to be finite. So that's a great, that's a great, that. great question. Um, okay, so the sphere is the most. You mean for the window, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you can take say the, the sphere is the window. most natural uh, shape to choose, especially if you're thinking about systems that have, you know, rotational invariance. But it's not necessarily the only shape that one could choose. So, for example, if I have anisotropy, then I might choose an ellipsoid for the window.
or I might choose a cube. And there are some anomalies that happen with cubes, if let's say you have a lattice, because then you can find placements in which it's actually zero uh, of fairness. But yeah, I mean, you're not limited to it, but it's the most natural and the most general in some sense, but not always. Like in that anisotropic case that I showed earlier, you probably would not use um, a spherical window. But are the notions uh, saying that the variance goes less than R to the D? Is it an independent of the window that you choose? It, it will go. It will go like so. There, there. Are, yeah, it's a great, uh, all great questions. It will grow like if it's a disordered system, and it still will grow like the surface area. If you're within that class, class one. Right. I think if there are no more questions, let's let's thank Sal again for the great talk.